In 2017, this journey began. And the reason it began was because I'm about to give a speech at, at uh, the Sprott show in Vancouver, and I'm thinking, Gee, what am I going to talk about? And I realized, well, that's interesting. The German Bundesbank has made a really big deal about repatriating their gold. Caught my attention, but what really caught my attention as I prepared for this speech is that within a few weeks of that, the Bank of Austria, the Bank of Poland, Hungary, Turkey, the Dutch National Bank, the Czech National Bank, Bank of Austria, they all did the same thing, give us back our gold. Well, geez, that, that really caught my attention. Why, after six years of a falling price, was it so important for these banks to repatriate their gold? In 1924, almost 100 years ago, economist John Maynard Keynes described the gold standard as a barbarous relic. Maynard Keynes declared gold as obsolete both in usefulness and value. Fast forward to almost a century after that badly aged statement, central banks, some of the most savvy investors with a lot of capital, have bought more gold in the last 18 months than they had done in the preceding 50-something years. In 2022 alone, the world's reserve banks bought 1,136 tons of gold, the most since 1967, the second highest value since 1950, and more than 150% compared to 2021. What makes the renewed interest in gold and silver even more exciting is that in the four decades leading up to the global financial crisis, central banks were completely focused on loading up on dollars and U.S. treasuries and reducing their gold holdings. Everything changed in 2008 when the gradual gold hoarding began. However, the real craze for precious metals didn't start until 2022 after the United States and other Western countries announced a bombardment of financial and economic sanctions against Russia. In 2019, for example, central banks bought a total of 374.1 tons of gold. At the time, the World Gold Council reported it as a historic high, but that was only 32% of what they purchased in 2022, with no signs of slowing down. According to renowned precious metals analyst and bullion dealer Andy Schechtman, the gradual, then not-so-gradual accumulation of gold and silver by central banks is not only a testament to the relevance of both assets, but also a huge warning that you need to prepare for what's coming. Andy recently spoke at the 2023 Stockpulse Silver Symposium where he laid out the undeniable signs of central banks preparing for a huge global crisis that could shake the world to its very root. But it's not just the preparation that is noteworthy, but what they are preparing with. Gold and silver, assets that were previously referred to as barbarous relics and almost completely abandoned by everyone but a handful of retail investors. We will now clips from Andy's highly informative address at the symposium. Ensure you stick to the end of the video so you don't miss any important piece of information from one of the metals industry's brightest minds. Also, ensure you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you are yet to do so, and turn on the notifications bell for more videos like this. Thanks and enjoy. In 2017, it was a really bad time to own a precious metals company because you had Bitcoin going to the moon, you had equities performing perfectly, and you had gold languishing and, and falling. In fact, that was after six years of a bear market. Hit its peak in 2011, 1950 bucks, $50 silver, last time we saw that, and then slowly, slowly it meandered down. And I, in fact, 2017, I didn't want to go to work. I'd rather play golf. Six out of 10 phone calls in 2017 were people, people selling. My whole career, which is 33 years, no one ever sells. And they don't sell because they buy it as wealth. They buy it to hope to never use it. If they need it, they're damn glad they have it. If not, they give it to their kids or their grandkids. So as we go through this discussion, to me, gold and silver are wealth, period. They're not an investment. Yeah, you own enough of it, you'll be wealthy. It's not an investment. It is wealth that has outlived two world wars, German hyperinflation, the Great Depression, every pandemic. And it just so happens that the most well-funded and more importantly, well-informed traders on the planet, the central banks, just so happens coincidentally that they have purchased more over the last 18 months than at any time in history. Do you think that's a coincidence? I don't. So anyways, in 2017, this journey began. And 
The reason it began was because I'm about to give a speech at, at uh, the Sprott show in Vancouver, and I'm thinking, Gee, what am I going to talk about? And I realized, well, that's interesting. The German Bundesbank has made a really big deal about repatriating their gold. And if you read the article, it said that they tried to do it a few years before. And at, at this point, it's been two, three years, and the US hasn't sent back their gold that we've been holding forever. And they made a big deal about it in the media. Give us back our gold, says the Bundesbank. Caught my attention, but what really caught my attention as I prepared for this speech is that within a few weeks of that, the Bank of Austria, the Bank of Poland, Hungary, Turkey, the Dutch National Bank, the Czech National Bank, Bank of Austria, they all did the same thing. Give us back our gold. Not just from the New York Fed, but also from the Bank of England. And well, geez, that, that really caught my attention. Why, after six years of a falling price, was it so important for these banks to repatriate their gold? Now, mind you, it's an important thing to understand in a world that I believe by this time next year, you will all really understand the term counterparty risk. As I get into this, at the end of this presentation, you will see I believe that the banks are going to crater. Gold and silver are, are only assets, some of the only assets rather, that are not simultaneously someone else's liability. And so there's no counterparty risk. So anyways, maybe that's what they were doing. Give us back our gold. We don't want you to hold it, but it caught my attention. But the following year when I went back to Sprott to speak, well, I had a lot to talk about because those same banks, they bought more gold as a group than they did in the 60 years previously combined. Okay, something's going on now. So the fact that they repatriated their gold said something very significant to me. The fact that those same banks went on a buying spree, an unprecedented buying spree, should say something to you. From practically abandoning gold and silver for decades, even selling as much as they could for decades, to suddenly going on a buying spree, everything points to a yet-to-be full, revealed endgame. And these two metals will be right in the middle of that endgame. According to Andy, even if one were to chuck up all of the repatriation and historic high buying spree to nothing but mere coincidence, you've got to change that opinion when you consider that in the following year, 2019, central banks bought even more gold than they did in 2018, and even more in 2022. Another thing that Andy proves beyond a reasonable doubt is the impending collapse of the United States dollar, which he says is getting as unpopular almost at the same rate as gold is getting popular among central banks and other foreign investors. Let's get back to the speech as Andy discusses the collapse of the petrodollar system, the Belt Road Initiative, and the increasing possibility of a global banking industry and financial systems collapse. But I find it interesting that the following year, they buy 100% more than they did the year before. And what do you know? Could it be coincidence? It must be, right? Because obviously the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank or central bank, the most powerful bank in the world, well, they wouldn't have told the central banks, get your stuff in order, bring back your gold, and start buying it because we're going to make it tier one. What does that mean? That means that since the end of World War II, there's been basically one asset that was considered tier one, and that was US dollars and US treasuries. But out of nowhere, almost 80 years later, they decide to say, well, you know what, gold is up there too. And if it's unencumbered, according to the, to the Basel III cla classification, it's liquid, it's wealth, it's money, it's tier one. So when you talk about the central banks not only repatriating their gold, but going on a buying spree, two and a half years before the central bank or central bank says, oh, by the way, it's tier one. Could it be coincidence? I think not. Now, at this point, I'm really, really starting to talk about this. And this is when I started doing YouTubes. And it's weird because the world makes you feel like you're a conspiratorialist or you're a doom and gloomer, but you're not. There's a very fine line between conspiracy and reality. And you have to feel it in your gut. Your gut is your best financial advisor. When I saw this, I said, oh, something, something's really, really going on here with gold, that the central banks are on their way to doing something. Then I stumble across the Belt Road Initiative. And I don't know how many of you really know what the Belt Road Initiative is. If you don't, you ought to. Don't raise your hand again. But this is the largest infrastructure project in human history. 
ever attempted, and it's China's way of connecting Asia, Africa, South America, parts of Europe. The really important thing here is that number one, the maritime channels, the roads, the bridges, the railways, all of this infrastructure will be patrolled by military, period, and commerce. It is the Panama Canal on steroids. The United States has nothing to do with this. And do you know what? 75% of human population is on the Belt Road right now. 75% of the world's population is on Belt Road, 50% of global GDP. But the most important thing that I would tell you about the Belt Road is every single OPEC producer is on the Belt Road Initiative. Every single OPEC producer is on the Belt Road Initiative. He, he slides in there and he signs Executive Order 14057. You all know what that is? That's, we're going green. We don't need you, Saudi, or any of you OPEC countries. We're going green. I'm like, well, okay, now this is getting bad. But this is the beginning of stupidity. When you tell, in essence, the world we are going green, and I will ask you all, to me there are three things, but what makes the dollar the world reserve currency? Most people don't know. People have a good idea, but to me, the very first thing that makes the dollar the world reserve currency is the deal that Henry Kissinger struck with the Saudi kingdom, 1973, that, hey, we'll protect you. But for that protection, you're going to value all oil globally in US dollars. And it's been that way for 50 years. So every single country on the planet has had to own dollars to buy oil. It's a synthetic demand. There's no coincidence that Saudi Arabia and Russia sign a joint military cooperation agreement. Now, let me say that one more time. Saudi Arabia and Russia sign a joint military cooperation agreement. Do we see a problem with that? Wasn't it our protection of the Saudi kingdom that gave us that dollar hegemony? Huh, well let's go back. Hey, he signs the executive order to go green. They all repatriate their gold, it's tier one. We leave like a bunch of idiots, and then Saudi Arabia signs a deal with Russia. It's purely coincidental, don't you think? The day after that, they sign it with Nigeria, another large OPEC producer. Do you see the thing starting to take shape? At this point, I'm convinced. During his address, Andy explains the concept of logarithmic decay a gradual collapse that begins little by little, so little that it is completely imperceptible to the undiscerning and unobservant. Then, it becomes more pronounced, and everyone realizes something is happening, but they still cannot detect the magnitude at which it's going to happen. Then, one day, without any warning at all, everything collapses and everyone gets wiped out. This is what Andy believes is happening with the global financial system at the moment. It is definitely no coincidence that central banks, the custodians of this system are seeking protection in gold and silver, buying at the highest levels they've done in more than half a century. Do you agree we are heading for a collapse, starting with the global banking system? What role do you think gold and silver will play in the coming collapse? Please drop your comments and observations in the comments section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.